The Home Builders Association of East Central Illinois is building a high-performance, certified green home on Horizon Road in Urbana. Green building means incorporating environmental considerations and resource efficiency into every step of the home building and land development process to minimize environmental impact. It's a practical response to a variety of issues that affect all of us, like increasing energy prices, waning water resources, and changing weather patterns. It means making intentional decisions about energy efficiency, water conservation, resource conservation, indoor environmental quality, site design, homeowner education, and green business practices. Building performance is a growing industry nationwide. The rising cost of energy, increased interest in indoor air quality, ongoing demand for better comfort, and timeless concern for building durability require that we focus on building science more than ever. I'm Tony Oliver, Building Performance Manager at Lands Heating and Cooling. I'm a home energy rater, certified building analyst, and your host for today's program. If you'd like to join us in our mission to help make America energy independent, the first step is understanding energy. Again, I'm Tony Oliver of Lands Heating and Cooling, and uh, part of our typical home builder's calendar for the year is to do a showcase of homes here in Champaign County, and because construction is a little bit slower this year, a decision has been made that instead of doing a whole showcase of many homes, we're going to do one special project, which is a green build designed to educate the public on green construction, energy efficient construction, and also we're working to train the trades on how to build green and energy efficient. So as part of our Green Build program, I'll uh, be interviewing Alan Dooley of Lexington Construction in Urbana. And uh, Alan, would you tell us a little bit about yourself? My name is Alan Dooley, and I'm uh, uh, born and raised in Urbana and have been in uh, residential construction uh, my entire life as it were, uh, born into it uh, uh, with my father, uh, Roger Dooley, and, and who's been here uh, building homes since the end of World War II and uh, developing subdivisions around the area. Um, Southridge subdivision, where the home, where the green build is being built, is uh, one of our subdivisions uh, in conjunction with Carl Hill, we are partners in, and uh, We've, uh, uh, what was the term you were going to use? We were going to, you were using the term provide. Provide. Okay. Um, uh, so Carl Hill and, uh, and our, myself have provided the lot for the Green Build subdivision, or for the Green Build home. And, uh, uh, we're also providing the um, excavating and foundation uh, basement and erosion control for the project. So you've done a lot of other work around the neighborhood as well. Uh, real quick, what, what other things have you done in the area? In Champaign-Urbana, um, we uh, bid, you know, uh, for example, um, uh, 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 Landis Farms, um, done, have, we've done phases of, of Landis Farms, uh, phases of Somerset, um, phases of uh, uh, Ironwood in Champaign, um, phases of, uh, oh, uh, I think Devonshire, um, uh, so, so a lot of the, a lot of the f uh, different phases of, of the residents. So you're primarily involved in developing the land, putting in the roads, the drainage, getting it all ready, getting the lots all set up for construction so all our other builders can come in and build homes. That's right. Um, then of course when we start to overbuild like we are in today then I have to fall back and, and, and help to fill those lots and so forth and, and help in the construction of homes. And, well, we all get to reinvent ourselves. I think yeah. that that's a good yeah. thing. Yeah. And uh, if, if the business is to be sustainable, we have to find out what the public wants and maybe kind of help them learn what they want because sometimes people don't know what they want. Yeah. We, we put on showcases of homes so that we can show people the new products, the new colors of paint, the new 
interiors and the new concepts like green building. Yep. Yep. It's very exciting to me because I've, I've been wanting to, uh, it brings forth a, a, an avenue for me to bring out the ICF construction uh, that, you know, the, the, the part of this house was, the basement part of this house is ICF. So those are insulated concrete insulated forms. Insulated concrete forms, yes. And uh, so to me, it, in, in one respect, it's, it's kind of a, a new thing, thought maybe in the area, although um, I think Ivan Richardson has been doing it for many years in his subdivision. And mm -hmm. uh, um, although it's still not as commonplace as I think it should be, um, so I'm, you know, I'm trying to, to bring it forth and, and you know, take it to the next level if with, any, you know, with any luck. So how are insulated concrete forms different from your run-of-the-mill everyday concrete, concrete forms? forms. The, the, in, in terms of the code, the finished product is the same as far as the concrete part of the product. But the insulating part of the product in a standard basement, it provides for uh, no insulation. So therefore, you, you must build that uh, in conjunction with the, uh, according to today's code, you have to have, you know, yesterday you didn't have to have insulation in the basement, and today you do. Um, so you have to build that uh, after you put in a normal, uh, you know, concrete basement. Uh, with this procedure, you can use the insulation to create the forms, pour the concrete, uh, pour the concrete, and leave the insulation in place. And so you've eliminated one step out of the process of creating the basement. So you're forming the concrete with foam, then mm -hmm. you're abandoning the forms, and they become the insulation, insulation for the building, and maybe that saves some labor, and there are some assembly benefits to that as mm. well. As well. And, and a high, high quality insulation. So you've worked with insulated concrete forms before. They're not all the same brand. How long have insulated concrete forms been around? They've been around, um, th this particular brand that we're using is called Arx Blocks. They've been around since, I believe, 78. Mm -hmm. So some 30 years. Um, I started some 38 years ago, and they weren't, at the, I know they weren't around then. Mm -hmm. uh, through the years, you go through, start going to, they have a concrete convention, and you start to go there. And it, it, it was about eight years. In, in the late 70s is so when you started to see these companies come into uh, you know, into the into the into the uh, conventions and so forth and um, you know very slowly at first and then and then just all kinds of them and through the years they've uh, like the telephone companies they've merged and and uh, now we're down to a handful of of companies that provide uh, uh, some very, some very nice products. So the long and short of it for people who are curious is that the technology was not invented yesterday. No, it's it's been, been around for a good 30, 30 plus years. years. Yeah. And so there's been a long history of buildings that are built that we've been able to observe and we know their performance in fire, we know their energy performance, uh, mm -hmm their assembly performance and so on. Yeah. So for people who think that this is new, it may be new to our area, mm -hmm. even though, as you said, Ivan Richardson has been using them for, to, to my memory, 15 years. Yes, so. at least, yeah. Uh, he may, Ivan's kind of a, maybe a pioneer on a lot of energy performance yeah. type of stuff. And of course, we're trying to get everybody to, to build a better house in a lot of different ways, especially energy, mm -hmm. which is one of the things that makes this a green home. Yeah. So another part of building green is make sure that all this valuable black Illinois topsoil doesn't get washed away during construction, which is, let's be honest, we've all been on construction sites where you sink up to your knees in mud. And uh, we know that a lot of that mud's being tracked out on the road and washed away. So what are we doing different on this job site to make it a little less erosive? Um, the, the the job site in, in general is not any different than any other job site in terms of that. It's the fact that the um, federal government has mandated that the certain erosion 
control procedures be put into place. And the cities are now starting to uh, implement those uh, regulations. And um, their uh, kind of their job is to more or less police those regulations to see that that builders and so forth start to follow them. Um, so so uh, it's 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 kind of new, but it's not specific just to the green build. Mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. And um, the uh, the things that are required in this is that you have a um, a rock stabilized entrance into the job site um, so uh, that the vehicles that would leave the street and, and enter the job site would would uh, enter the job site and exit over this gravel uh, drive um, the the thought being that should any mud be picked up on the job site, it would hopefully be lost in the gravel drive and not uh, transferred to the street. Uh, then the next item is that any part of the job site that would drain off, where the water on the job site would drain off onto uh, another property, should be uh, fenced with a uh, what they call silt fence that would um, filter any water or silt or anything and that out of the water and allow the water to pass and um, keep the soil and on keep the, the soil on the site not only the soil but um, debris from the building uh, uh, process so really it turns out that as far as erosion control fire control handicap access energy efficiency the code authorities have been thinking ahead about this. The government's been very proactive, but we've kind of been behind on enforcement and the, the trades, you and me and all the people who have been driven, driving nails for all these years, mm -hmm. haven't got the education that we need yet. That's part of the purpose of this project, to get the trades to come in, see how we're building. Mm -hmm. And as much as we hate to say it, not all codes have been enforced the way maybe they should be enforced. Um, we're trying to build a better product for the customer mm. and be more responsible in the community. That's, that's the goal, <laughs> with any luck. So, and, and also we don't want to be in a position of running afoul of the law anyway. So right. we, we have an opportunity here to, to bring all our builders and homeowners in to, to understand what's going on. And there, of course we're in Champaign-Urbana, mm. which is a town built on a swamp Right, exactly. That would be fair to say. Yeah. And so we, we've had a real history of flooding. Somebody, a friend of mine at the university, showed me a flood map of Champaign-Urbana, and almost the whole town is just red. <laughs> and I don't know how Southridge looks on that map. I don't quite remember. Yeah. But what kind of special provisions have been made for drainage here, and why is drainage so important? In terms of the subdivision? or In terms of the subdivision and the site. Um, uh, for, well, fortunately, Southridge, as as its name, is is a ridge, and uh, was uh, I don't know what back they called it, maybe the Meyer Ridge. The Meyer Ridge. And uh, um, actually, this house uh, happens to be sitting on the top of that ridge, uh, uh, as it were, uh, and we've actually taken uh, probably three feet off of that ridge and and transferred it, uh, you know, through. Uh, to kind of level out the ridge to make it more, more level and so forth. But by the time you, you know, uh, uh, to the east of the, the lot, it falls off this ridge uh, quite dramatically. And mm -hmm. um, probably, I'm thinking some 20 feet in elevation and so forth. So the whole subdivision in terms of uh, controlling drainage um, and erosion, the whole subdivision uh, drains all its sewer systems and so forth uh, go into a retention cell that is on the uh, east side of, the, of this ridge mm -hmm. and go out into that retention cell and then from there go into uh, you know farther to the east through a field tile um, and uh, so the retention cells which are now a common place for uh, you know, as you go to any subdivision in Champaign-Urbana, mm -hmm. it's either going to have a lake or they're going to have I mean, these. new subdivision. 
<laughs> yes, and he, right. and he knew so. It was within the last uh, mm -hmm. 15 years, maybe, I think. Yeah, 15, less uh, than 20 years. Yeah. And, you know, they're going to have either what they call a dry detention, in which case uh, it must drain out within 24 hours after the mm -hmm. event, or it's going to be a, a wet detention, which would be the, the lakes and so forth that you see around town. So a, a dry detention releases the water to another waterway and a wet detention evaporates it? Uh, no, no, it does the same thing. Wet detention does the same thing. It, it, uh, uh, it releases the same rate. The only difference is that the wet detention doesn't ever have to become dry. But in terms of how it detains this water and releases its water is the same. So a wet detention isn't holding that water for evaporation. So I think, I hope it's fair to say that all construction is becoming yes. more sustainable. And I believe, I don't know of any of these subdivisions that are built this way that are having, you know, really issues in terms of uh, drainage and so forth in today's, you know, compared to, you know, all the complaints that are going on around uh -huh. town, the wet basements and so forth, I believe are in the older phases. They um, are, so hopefully we can get all that yeah, so those older developments fixed because I think that people maybe didn't expect there to be so much development and s there to be so much rainwater. Of yeah. course, when we pave an area, that's water that used to soak down yeah. into the ground. And now we're creating and now more, runs off. more runoff. So. Mm -hmm. And then what, what happens? It eventually all ends up in Louisiana. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, an insulated concrete form, as you said before, is heavy gauge or very durable styrofoam that we use to form up the walls. We pour the concrete inside and we abandon it in place. That's it. So this is uh, the ARCS brand system. product. Yeah. And it's very similar in most ways to the other brands. Everybody's got their own bells and whistles. That's exactly right. But uh, they all work kind of basically the same. They stack like Legos, don't they? Exactly. That's what everybody says. They Inter stack like Legos. They interlock. And the, the way they interlock is dependent upon the different brands have a little bit different uh, locking mechanism. Uh, different brands that have a little bit different dimension in terms of height. Uh, the, the thickness dimension is common, um, basically dictated by the uh, codes. Uh, and the building industry is, is used to walls in two inch increments. Um, and the energy code requires a certain amount of foam of, of, of foam on the inside uh, and outside. Uh, so they're, really they're not, on the, not only I think the code is just uh, insulation really doesn't uh, dictate inside or outside. I think it's just a certain amount. The, there are, we'll, we'll get into that but, in another yeah, episode yeah. Uh, because it turns out I did come back from code school just the other day. Oh, so good. I don't want to blow everybody's okay. spots. <laughs> But uh, being such, I, I think this is well, I think this is twice as, as good as the codes. It, it, oh, it is. Yeah. I'm sure that it is. It's very, very yeah. near. The now, w when I was, since you got to say that you've been in construction yeah. for 38 years, yeah. I've been building since uh, as long as a guy my age can be building. Okay. And uh, I'll be 40 here pretty soon, so over half my life. And I remember when insulated concrete forms pretty much came in one block. You had to take a, a back saw and cut, you know, cut a miter in it to mm -hmm. do your corners. Oh, yes. So nowadays we've gotten a little more sophisticated. We have these corner blocks. So I don't know if you call this a right-handed corner or left-handed corner. Or left-handed corner. You know, I'm not even sure either. But, but we have uh, both. But have both. In, 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 this particular, uh, in this particular brand, uh, some brands are, aren't dependent upon a left and a right. And, and that's because you can turn the block over and there is no top and sure, bottom. Okay. In, in this particular brand, there's a top and a bottom, therefore there must be a left and a right because they, they have to, uh, in order to, to uh, the, the whole purpose of the Lego construction bit is to not have the seams line up. So you have to have these staggering seams. Um, basic principle uh, of construction. Yeah, yeah, basic principle, and, and therefore uh, you have a, a left and a right in this case. And uh, the... Uh, 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 also, as you can see from this shot, that not only um, do we, we have the form, but we now have uh, in the bracing system for the form, we now have the, uh, the interlocking mechanism to apply 
a, a surface against the form built into it. So this becomes our stud that we can screw drywall against. Exactly. In this particular case, on the inside, on the outside, no studs so that we can finish it. And, and in actuality, the stud is there. Uh, well, it is there, right. And it's just recessed into the foam. And um, th the point being that if you would like a, a stucco surface of some sort, mm -hmm. uh, either a cementitious surface or a latex surface of some sort that would go on to the foam, it works uh, maybe a little better without the plastic exposed. And, and therefore, and actually in any other model other than Arx, you will always see this as this surface because mm -hmm. Arx is the only one with the patent to actually expose ah. the stud. Well, that's the advantage <laughs> of getting into the business early. Yeah. And, and then of course the webbing here is, yeah. so is used to support reinforcing steel as well as to, as to keep, keep the, the two pieces of foam, foam at a constant distance right. the way we want it to be. Exactly. So that's obviously your corner piece. Um, then the straight blocks are is in the uh, in the arcs um, design. Th this is actually a one foot block, but arcs's main block is a 16 and uh, three quarter inch. Now this gives you the ability to achieve uh, uh, eight foot four inches, uh, so that you uh, in a normal basement you would you would pour the footing and then the wall, and then you'd have four inches four of floor. Foot, four inch slab. And then, and then, so your ceiling height then, in, in normal basement construction, the forms have always been eight foot or nine foot. Mm -hmm. And so your, your ceiling. You're either too short or too tall. Yeah, <laughs> a little bit off. So, so in this particular uh -huh. model, you can, you can achieve that true eight foot clearance after the floor, or by adding this one foot block, you can get a nine foot clearance. So one would hope that you can save a little bit of assembly time by using a taller block. Like a taller block and so forth. And different model, different companies, uh, I, don't, I know Nodura uh, has a 18 inch uh, one which gives them the 8 foot wall or and then they have a 1 foot to get the 9 foot but then they're missing the 4 inches. Mm -hmm. So they mm -hmm. all seem to have a 4 inch block that you can buy. <laughs> <laughs> if you if you want to achieve that, so well, I guess you have to try to have a gimmick. Like I said, yeah, they all have their own different models. They all, models they all have their they? their own little thing. Um, the, uh, another model is that you have just the styrofoam sheets, and you basically I've build that, the block. Right. Uh, it, it's here in town uh, called Quadlock, and there's a supplier here in town. A builder supply supplies that, those. Uh, uh, Arcs is supplied here in town through ProBuild mm -hmm. uh, out of Tolono, and uh, the, the other one here in town is what they call Fox Blocks. I think uh, that you can get through uh, Menards, which is uh, very similar to to, to uh, Narcs. So there's a quad block house just a block away, block or so away from yeah. the Green yeah. Build, yeah. which is by the way is on Horizon in Southridge exactly. in, in Urbana. Yeah. So here, of course, we have our end end block component here so it's that when we get to uh anytime you have an end wall or something it makes it makes it quite handy to, to create that uh, um there uh, you know because of 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 this uh, the styrofoam effect and everything uh, there's just all kinds of things that you can do beyond the realm of just these blocks um, in terms of of shaping these to your own unique shape and so forth to create uh, you know uh, everything from you know radius uh, walls to to uh, whatever the imagination mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and I may talk about it more at a later time but really an energy efficient home is probably going to be as simple as possible not mm -hmm. real chopped up right uh, wh the way some of the construction that we see is we try to keep it compact and, and simple so yeah. Not a lot of crazy stuff going on with this particular with this foundation. Yeah. Pretty routine. Routine, and and this is this is an R. This block is an R22, just as it stands. Mm -hmm. um, poured with um, six inches of concrete in there. Um, the manufacturer tries to say that this is an this is an equivalent to mm -hmm. an R40, mm -hmm. and. Uh, 
when, uh, um, you know, I don't know technically if this is true and, or not, but when you stand inside of one, it sure seems it. it it's a very, very, the quietest home you'll ever get into this as far as I've ever been mm -hmm. in. And in terms of keeping the, the air uh, infil you know, filtration out, uh, providing you don't put, you know, provide, put the whole wall full of windows, um, you, you, can't, you can't beat the product. So the claims are really based on the fact that air leakage through a surface like this is, is pretty close to impossible. Obviously, air is always going to get yeah, in. Right. But you say this is an R22. Mm -hmm. We know that the International Energy Conservation Code calls for R10, so it's literally more than twice right. Right. what's called for in the in energy the basement, code. In the basement portion. And yet you still have a good solid concrete wall. Exactly. The exact thickness of, as you notice in this, this form, you can see these ridges, which are, are part of uh, ARC's design also. Um, but uh, a lot of the other uh, blocks will have a smooth, that will be smooth in there. Mm -hmm. um, then there, there's a, another one that they call a, a waffle a style, which is- Kind of a post and beam post construction. And beam construction. Um, and uh, I, I have never seen one, but it uh, uh, sounds dangerous to me. <laughs> we, we looked at them in college, which, uh, of course, is a long time ago. Uh, but, uh, and, and then I think there's one other one that they mention in the code book that I've not seen, and, uh, uh, and I'm not even sure how to uh, describe it, but uh, there's, a, there's a, a chart in the code book that, that that relates to it, but I don't. I've never seen it, so I don't know what. It, what it, I don't know if it's a tilt-up situation or what. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, they've all now. The code books used to be such that they would uh, differentiate between this and a normal basement wall. And in the 2009 code book, international code book, uh, the the there is no differentiation, and and they just say it's a flat uh, concrete wall. And it's this, mm -hmm. it's this mm -hmm. thick, and this is, you know, the, the, the steel requirements is basically... Uh, That's what we want to know. What you want to know, yeah. So there was some discussion about the erosion control on the job site to prevent silt and topsoil from washing away. So what we see are some of these curtains around the edge, and these are called silt walls? These are called silt fences and uh, basically buried about six inches deep uh, and then there's a, a, uh, another six inches. Uh, uh, these are, these are a, a portable silt fence. Uh, we call them uh, eels and they're made out of, uh, of uh, uh, old rubber uh, tires. Uh, so they're a recycled uh, material. Um, and, and they, can be, they can be moved so that uh, uh, and they don't have to be staked down because they're heavy enough. This is this is what's inside of them is some uh, is the recycled uh, chopped up tires, uh, which makes them portable. Uh, whereas the the silt fences are not portable. They're dug into the ground and very very hard to move once they're in. There. Yeah, these animals are actually harder to move than they look, and they're they're awful heavy. Yeah, these are heavy. The the, uh, the advantage is that you, because they're heavy, you don't have to stake them down. Where other portable devices are usually light, uh, then you have to stake them down, so. And bury them, of course. And, yeah. and bury them, so. Which becomes a whole big operation later on. And there's a, um, uh, uh, here's a, a, is where we're starting to uh, uh, form the basement, and, and this is the, how the arcs block comes, uh, you know, in, in bundles already stacked together, uh, uh, you know, placed on the footing, those are, are, are an end cap. Um, uh, so these are basically the things we just discussed. Just discussed. Here we are reinforcing the, uh, the th concrete wall. Th th this is not, that's not actually a reinforcement piece, that's an alignment piece, as it were, it, uh, uh, in there. But you, and you can see the little snap in there, and uh, the wall ties, they, they use wall ties, or uh, uh, regular, uh, I call them zip ties. Mm -hmm. um, they use those uh, to help uh, hold the blocks together along with the, the block 
uh, 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 design itself. So some of this stuff is more or less temporary until the concrete's in place. Yeah, in, in place and then no longer like, like that. And then th as you can see down in there, the re-rods that are, are, are linearly, those become, uh, have nothing to do with, with pouring it, but are, are in fact the, uh, the main structure uh, with the concrete, you know, once the wall has set in place. So uh, Illinois is more seismic probably than people realize. And uh, also we want to prevent cracking in this concrete which is a major problem in concrete foundations if they're not reinforced properly. Yeah. And, and, and unfortunately, people uh, have to realize that concrete is guaranteed to crack. <laughs> and therefore, we need the steel so that when the crack does occur, uh, the steel bonds uh, 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 bridges the crack and becomes the strength uh, mm -hmm. uh, of that. Um, so uh, to see a crack in concrete is, is normal. And, uh, but we, we want to um, uh, uh, prepare for that crack and provide the strength for it. But with this product, we can't use what we used to call 60-40 concrete, where you pour the stuff in, it goes 60 feet one way and 40 feet the other because there's so much water in it. We have to, we have to use a, a lower slump concrete um, per the manufacturer's specifications. Okay. Um, not, not really. They've more or less, uh, they don't allow you to do that with water, but they do allow you to use that with super plasticizers, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. an admixture, and it basically is like putting water in concrete. It makes the concrete react that way, but it does not take away from the strength, because the more water you put in the concrete, the more strength you take away from the concrete. So uh, with the super plasticizers, uh, you can you can uh, get that run, and you can you can get that uh, filling the voids, so that you don't have to use vibration to do that. Um, but it is hard on on the ICF blocks, and one of the drawbacks of of most of the manufacturers is that you must pour the wall in lifts of not more than so many feet per hour mm -hmm. type of, of deal which is a little bit more stringent than uh, if you were doing this with a normal uh, concrete form. Mm -hmm. But it, in reality, it isn't, there isn't much difference. By the time you, you're doing everything that's involved, it's, it's not really taking any more time to, to pour it, um, you know, maybe an hour more than a normal wall. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but it is, it is most of the, of the blocks, you have to be careful and not put too much concrete in uh, you know, vertically at, uh, at a time. This particular construction required a jog wall. Uh, here, here's the window buck that will be placed into the form and concrete will be poured around it and uh, the window, uh, in this case an egress window in the basement, those are the two egress for windows escape. for escape. Uh, therefore, there, you, know, you could put a bed, bedroom there. and. Um, um, in this case, these are a pre-molded plastic that you cut to length for the desired uh, dimension of the window uh, that is then then put in and you could screw to that plastic. It's a, it, it, it becomes non, um, you know, it's not, uh, it won't rot away or anything from mm -hmm. the wood and so forth. So we'll be able to get concrete in underneath this mm -hmm. by virtue of consolidating it with some vibration. Vibration. And, um, as you saw in that last hole, there's actually a, a void, a thickness in there so that you can screw through that and mm -hmm. not have to screw into concrete, through concrete. Uh, to, to pr put your uh, window in. There's, it's being poured and, and it, that's underneath uh, to, to be sure that you, now, you know that the concrete is, is completely under the sill. So and that lets the air out and also lets, lets you verify what's verify going on that, in there. That you've filled that void and uh, uh, the, the, the other means of doing this kind of thing is, is to use wood. Um, you just have to make sure that the wood doesn't come in contact with the concrete, either by a vapor barrier or treated lumber or some means like that. If it's going to be left permanently. Yeah, well, it, and, it, and, and most of them are. Most of them are wood and, and they're mm -hmm. left permanently. 
So when you assemble these foam blocks, of course, they could float away. They are foam. Yeah. So they have to be braced up, in some cases tied down, maybe not so much with this product. But here we see you bracing them. This is a bracing uh, system, and it's, it's not that dissimilar from a normal bracing system that we would use on uh, a forming. The only difference is that, this, that vertical brace wouldn't be, if it was a normal uh, forming mechanism, they wouldn't do vertical bracing. They would do horizontal uh, bracing with the uh, diagonal uh, adjustable brace out and staked in as, as shown here. Um, and their, their walking boards and so forth are basically tied to the form where ours are tied to these braces. Um, uh, here you see a, a, a strapping tape that is put uh, on the corners uh, to, and basically just as a, as a, as a precaution uh, as the concrete is setting that, uh, to help g you know, give the block some strength. Mm -hmm. until the concrete sets. So what are these little mushroom caps These little here? mushrooms are, are uh, a safety pr uh, uh, procedure for so no one can impale themselves on <laughs> mistakes if they would fall off. Certainly it has happened before. It has happened before. So the idea is when you hit the thing, it'll bend the reinforcing bar before it tries to penetrate you. Well, I think it's, your, just, your body it's, blunt, it's blunt enough, yeah, or that you would bounce off of it. Mm -hmm. more than impale into it, I think, or something. Well, let's not try it. Yes. So here we're consolidating the concrete with some vibration. Yes. Which is actually, we're using a reciprocating saw so, to create enough vibration. Yeah. Uh, and th this is an external vibration against, uh, uh, along the uh, wall. Um, internal vibrators are, uh, a little trickier, a little more dangerous, in my opinion, in terms of... Uh, because you could blow the foam you apart? You could blow the foam apart. Um, uh, so to, to me, the external vibration is, is adequate. Sure, if you grab one of these vibrators, it feels like you're being shocked <laughs> with 240 <laughs> volts. For those who haven't tried it yeah. on a dare. But as you can see in the wall, there's both horizontal and vertical steel. Um, the amount of uh, the amount of vertical steel in today in today's construction just blows my mind <laughs> compared to what we did years and years ago. Um, yeah, we we absolutely had no vertical steel whatsoever, uh, and we'd only have a couple rows of horizontal steel, although we would pour a little bit thicker wall. Um, here, as you can see, the top. That top block is is a little bit different. Um, it's wider, as you can see, and this is so that when the uh, rim board is is put on there, it, that is parallel with the floor trusses, mm -hmm. that the weight will of the of the weight of the wall will, on that rim board will be on concrete. Uh, since since the oh instead of sitting on instead top of, of sitting foam. on top of the foam where the where the rim board is is per perpendicular to the floor joist we don't care because the floor joist is going to cross the concrete anyway. This is just a shot of the water main there in the trench that goes to it. Mm -hmm. Here we have a water main access underneath the wall and, and that, one that, of our fellows from Lands Plumbing. Plumbing. But it's as you can see there, that gives a shot of the of the footing drain. That, that is a, a plastic uh, two inch by eight inch hollow and slotted, uh, which, which allows for the water to be collected uh, on both sides of the f footing and foundation. And it's surrounded by uh, oh, six inches to, to a foot of gravel, clean gravel. And, and, uh, and, and, uh, and there's a little uh, jumper right there. Huh? Channels the water to the sump pit that is right there. Uh, that's the one of that is a sump pit. The other is an injection pit for the sanitary sewer, and you do not want to get the two <laughs> mixed up. So again, we're forming up concrete with a form that we're going to abandon in place. In this exactly. case, it becomes our drain to get rainwater away from the building. Uh, uh, rainwater or groundwater uh, should uh, should the need be. Uh, in this case, there's no groundwater. The only water that would ever get to that is, is from rainwater. 
So the ejector pit that we see going in, this is a sump pit, of course, but the other uh, large plastic pit is for sanitary sewer? Sanitary sewer that would, so th there must be uh, at some point a, 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 a bathroom in the basement. So the plumbing that would be under the floor of the basement would have to go into ejection pit, I, I believe, in maybe in both cities, but I think in Urbana, because of all the past problems with sewers backing up and so mm -hmm. forth, we don't, they don't allow uh, sewers to go under the, There's the ejector pit now. basement floors anymore, and so therefore we must pump that up to a height that... Uh, like a trap, really. Yeah, like a trap type situation, and and then therefore the sanitary sewer won't back up into anybody's basement anymore. <laughs> so uh, we've gotten to where now we're going to see them pouring the concrete floor. This is it the happens floor. to be I, I got I got there just as they were about done. Uh, and and here they're doing it through a uh, uh, conveyor truck, so that they the the trucks don't have to leave the street. Uh, they're they're you know smooth, uh, smoothing the concrete and doing what they call wet screed to screed the concrete off. So these guys work for Mayfield Construction. I understand, yes. And there you can see them pouring it through pouring the chute there. Yeah. This looks like fun, doesn't it? Uh, it's, fun work. It's fun work. It's, it will definitely uh, <laughs> keep you in shape. Yeah, I don't think people realize how heavy that stuff is yeah. when you're trying to rake it around. And nothing gets the stains out, does it? <laughs> of the concrete. So what's this piece of uh, machinery? This is the trialing machine that, as the concrete sets, um, they will use this to, to smooth the surface of the concrete and close the surface so that it becomes uh, kind of a, a polished effect. Uh, uh, Does that prevent spalling later on? Prevent um, the surface it, from in, cracking? In, in, in how it does nothing in terms of cracking. And, um, in this case, there's, there's no weather to speak of so we don't really have to worry about a spalling effect in terms of weather. Uh -huh. um, so it's, it's just basically to to seal the concrete off. Uh, concrete's a porous material so this would make it the least porous as possible, the smoothest. Kind of like, like, sure. like a tile, smooth tile surface mm -hmm. um, to which you can then do anything you want. You can either leave it as the surface that it is or um, you know, put something over it. And so there's a lot of cleanup on all this equipment when the you concrete truck leaves, it's got to be washed. When the conveyor leaves, it's got to be washed. And there's a lot of finishing work on the on the wall here too. It, this is a, uh, unfortunately, we didn't have the convenience of, the, of uh, using the, the newer technology of the conveyor belts in this case. In this case, this was done you know, straight from the concrete trucks in a, kind of an old-fashioned way, but we were, the accessibility to the wall was such that it was very convenient to do. Um, it is just topping the wall off. You're basically just uh, finishing the wall to the, to the top of the foam. So what's this foam block that, uh, th that's right in front of us? There's a, a slug in there for a beam pocket. Explain what that is. Um, well, all the in, in most homes, the span for the floor joist is greater than the floor joist can handle to go from wall to wall. So there'll have to be um, some sort of supporting beam somewhere in the middle usually, or, or, or it could vary. In this case, I believe there are two different runs, I think, maybe three. Um, and the, the beam that would hold the floor joist would, one end of the beam would sit in that beam pocket on that concrete so that the top of the beam would be level with the top of the wall usually. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be, but in this case I think it, they are. So we'll break this piece of foam out later on yeah. and have a pocket to put that beam in. And there, there, there he's breaking it out and, and then, uh, then the beam will sit you know, on the, in that pocket. 
and so bolts are inserted in the top of the whole wall that the that the sill plate the floor, the green plate floor system is going to bolt into uh, a galvanized uh, anchor bolt um, uh, is placed in there I believe it's six foot intervals was in, and within the foot of the corners and um, and they'll bolt the uh, bolt the plate to that so overall with the exception of the products we're using we're kind of doing a conventional concrete pour here this is it is bolts the same the same way yeah. this concrete slump is very similar yeah. it gets topped the same exactly. um, we're, we're really just using the same products that we are used to using with a little bit more planning a little bit more elegance uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I think so. I think I, I think the, the the end the end result I think is a better product. Uh, so what's this that I'm looking at here? Th this is a uh, what I think we call it a dimple board, and those are there are some brackets that that hold it, and uh, you can you basically unroll it around from the top of the footing up, and uh, screw it in place to the to the plastic strips that are in the uh, foam block and this becomes uh, your um, uh, passage for the water to get from wherever the water would hit the wall down to the, it, should any water get between here and the wall it would allow for a uh, uh, you know, water will go in its path of least resistance. Mm -hmm. So the, the least resistance would be to go down these channels and go into the drain below rather than to go through the wall. So the dimples kind of maintain a distance a, between a the distance. backfill soil and the wall itself. Yeah, and, and are actually between the wall and the plastic itself. Mm -hmm. Okay. So like, on that side and on the other side of the dirt side, um, it 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 just it just becomes a barrier for the water to to get to the to the uh, foam. So should you know should the surface not be penetrated, then uh, water wouldn't even get to the inside. It would just would leak down the outside of it. Should the water get you know, penetrate and get between the foam and the dimple board, it would still be easier for the water to go straight to the to the bottom than to go through the wall. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, once it's at the bottom, it'll hit it, our former drain. Hit the, hits the former drain, uh, gets below the floor, and and doesn't become a problem into the leaking into the basement. And a certain amount of gravel is used in the backfill to try to allow water to continue to move along uh, that trench. The the yeah there's a there's a around a foot of gravel or more over the top of the former drain on the outside um, on the inside there's well four to six inches of gravel under the whole floor mm -hmm. so that that's a, that whole cavity is is drainable um, this gravel that you see being dumped here is is because it's they're under uh, other concrete slabs, the porch or the garage floor, and and we don't want settlement under those slabs, so mm -hmm. we're building those up with a re, re uh, uh, in this case, this is a uh, reprocessed uh, concrete, uh, a recycled concrete, okay. and uh, um, we're compacting this up. It does, it itself doesn't act that great as you know as. A, Allowing water to go through, but in this case, they're under under areas where water shouldn't won't be anyway. So part of our plan to build a green home is that we're trying not to compact the soil around the building very much by running across it with a lot of tractors the way we normally would do in construction. Mm -hmm. So we've brought in a boom crane that will be able to reach across the whole job site without a whole lot of compaction. Ironically, it takes a crane to set up this crane. Yes, it does. <laughs> but it's a pretty impressive piece of machinery. I've never worked with a boom crane this small, but it, it's it's pretty neat. It, it it's quite it's quite intriguing because uh, the operator basically works alongside the installer rather than sitting in some cab at some you know arms 
uh, uh, he's he's basically right there and can can guide everything. It's very quiet. Um, it 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 you know in this case it's a little it's quite it's overkill for the job, <laughs> but it, its concept is good in that. Mm -hmm. Uh, you don't have these huge cranes running up and down the city streets all the time. I mean, you, this is going to stay there through the duration of the job rather mm -hmm. than come to the job, uh, you know, five to ten times uh, in, in, the, in the build process. It's, it's going to just be there for the entire time and then, and then leave. So there's no cab at all. Literally, it's remote controlled. There's yeah, literally a it's, little it's remote, remote control, control box that the operator uses throughout the operation. Yeah. It's 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 quite interesting, and uh, I'm sure they had fun. <laughs> right, and an enormous amount of weight to balance this thing out. Yeah, yeah. That, I think the weight itself was a semi load of of weight. But as you can see, I mean, if you've got a crane like that coming, you know, down the street every every mm -hmm. time you need mm -hmm. to to set something at the house. And we do drive them down the street yeah. most of the time. Very yeah. rarely are they on a on a truck on a truck bed. I was out at the house earlier today, and they've they've got the roof trusses all set. So that was neat to see them set the roof trusses with a boom truck, yeah, with, boom crane. With that crane. So here we see what the the porch assembly. The, the, yeah, these are the, the stem walls, the the porches and uh, garage foundation walls being placed. Uh, this could have been done at the same time we did the basement, it, um, but this this you know I, I prefer to do it. In this procedure, and, and wait and backfill the um, the areas under those, uh, and, and then and then put the stem walls on at this stage. Also, uh, an awful lot of rain when we were building. When we were building, is is this you know you don't have to have everything done at once, and uh, it gives you more room to work around. We we wouldn't have been able to pour the wall the conventional way we would have had to have brought to have poured everything at one time mm. we would have had to have brought in a, a conveyor conveyor truck and uh, so you'll actually tie the stem walls to the they're, they're foundation of the main house with some reinforcing bar that gets epoxied into the they can be done two ways you could epoxy it into the drill and epoxy the the rods into the concrete or they could they could have been embedded in the concrete and left there to be uh, you know, to, to, to run out into the new wall uh, either, either way is, is a suitable mm -hmm. procedure. So maybe people don't realize how much really goes into building every house. There's all this <laughs> equipment and trucks, all kinds of trades on the job site. And uh, our, our goal, of course, here is to train the new trades or train the trades in these new ways of doing the same old stuff. And uh, also to educate the public in what green construction is. And uh, it's, been, it's been fun filming you on the job yeah. site <laughs> and talking to you here in the studio. So, uh, Alan Dooley, Lexington yeah. Construction, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tony. Mm -hmm.